Good morning and welcome to the online service for Sardis Baptist Church for Easter Sunday. Uh, we rejoice with you that we as Christians all around the world are able to celebrate the significance of this day together. Uh, wherever you are in your homes right now, we just encourage you just to uh, pray as a family, to allow the Lord and His Spirit just to work through your home and through the service right now. Uh, we're very excited about this service, not just because of Easter Sunday, but also because our new senior pastor, Pastor Michael Kimberly, will be installed as senior pastor at Sardis Baptist Church. And so that will be a part that all of us here and watching at home will be able to take part of, and we look forward to that. And so this morning, even though there's uncertainty in the world and confusion right now, remember the significance of this day that our Lord and Savior has overcome the grave, sickness, and death. And as believers, we can rejoice in that now and forever. you are this morning I welcome you and I would like to invite you to sing along with us as we sing Christ arose Yes, indeed, he has arisen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning, please. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Not only that it's Easter Sunday morning and your Savior, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has arisen from the grave to take our sins upon his shoulder to pay them at your feet that we should have eternal life. And always remember that you sit on the, he sits on the throne beside you and intercedes for us and all of our sins. We thank you this day for, for, for bringing us Pastor Michael Kimberly to be as our senior pastor, a, a man of faith, and the person you have chosen to lead this church. We thank you for that. We thank you for his family who has also joined him today, that they will also serve alongside him and be a supporter for him and lift him up 
and always be there for him as this church will be there for him. We also thank you for this church and the people in this church. A lot of them, due to situations, we're not able to gather this morning as a congregation, but we can gather in our homes and pray together and worship together. This is just a derailment among, for our faith. We will stand strong, we will be one, and we will overcome this issue of this virus. So long as we stand strong together and keep you at the forefront of everything that we do, we will overcome. I ask your blessings upon each and every one who's within the sound of our voice this morning who's watching us on the video, that God blesses you, but remember what this day is. It is not Easter eggs, it's not clothing, it's, it is not really family get together. It is celebrating his rising from the tomb to intercede for us through his Father and forgive us of our many sins. And this thank and this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Start his family. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Family, we're here today to celebrate Christ's resurrection. This is Resurrection Sunday, Christ's triumph over the grave. And today is especially important because we're here to experience the installation service of our new pastor, Michael Kimberly. Steve Ferguson will be officiating our service this morning. This installation service is all about joining our church together and uh, committing ourselves to the church and the pastor and the pastor to the church and to you. Lord God, we just uh, thank you for this day. This is a beautiful day. Steve has been, was designated years ago as a friend of Sardis for all of his service to this church and this church's assembly and uh, many, many services he's given us through the years, including assistance in calling of our pres uh, Pastor Michael as well as John Silver 13 years ago. Steve is the missionary for the Even Baptist Association, the longest serving associational missionary that we've had at the Hebrew Baptist Association. This is a service of commitment, a commitment, a commitment by the pastor and the church. You've been given a script to go by. You received it by email. I, I would hope that you would break it out, burn it off, make a copy, and follow along and make this commitment with us as we go along. Dr. Ferguson. Thank you, Snip. It is good to be here uh, on this occasion and to be able to share in it with you. And we are grateful to God uh, for his call upon Michael Kimberly's life and uh, for how he placed him here for such a time as this. Uh, I have had a telephone conversation with him. I am grateful for his heart uh, and his love for the, for the Father and his love for the Father's church. Uh, I want to ask Michael, if he would, to come forward at this time. I want to share a passage of scripture uh, and then also lead us uh, in this covenant of commitment. And so, Michael, the text that, uh, that I want to share with you as well as the congregation comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning with verse 11. But you, man of God, flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you have made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God who gives life to all and of Christ Jesus who gave a good confession before Pontius Pilate, I charge you to keep this command without fault or failure until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. God will bring this about in his own time. He is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, who no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal power. Amen. Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God, who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of what is truly life. Guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding irreverent and empty speech and contradictions from what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some people have departed from the faith. Grace be with you all. And now we come to the time of uh, the sharing of this commitment and this covenant with each other. And so, Michael, to you, first I want to share, having been led to, excuse me, having been called to be the pastor of this church, do you take this people to be your people, this field of labor 
to be your field without reservation of mind or heart? I do. Do you promise to give yourself faithfully to the ministry, to the word, and to prayer, to be a good shepherd of this flock of God, to minister to the needs of all alike, to be the friend of all who would permit you, to seek the salvation of souls and nurture of the same, to put the services of Christ in his kingdom above all else, if wronged, to forgive as you expect to be forgiven, to seek always to keep yourself mentally alert and physically fit as much as in you lies, to be at peace with all people, and to lead this church in the ways of Christ as the Holy Spirit gives you wisdom and strength? I do. And now to the congregation. Do you promise to hear attentively to the preaching of the word, to participate reverently in the services of worship, to share with this pastor in the responsibilities of teaching and learning, to assume your proportionate part of the church's benevolent ministries, to receive him into your hearts and homes, to counsel with him about the welfare of the church and the winning of souls, to encourage him in his stand for right, to forgive him when he makes mistakes, and to follow his leadership as he follows Christ? We do. Let us together reaffirm our high resolution and devotion to preaching the good tidings of salvation. We consecrate our gifts. To teaching Jesus' way of life. We consecrate our time to leading children and youth to the knowledge of the love of Christ. We consecrate ourselves. To healing broken bodies and soothing troubled minds. We consecrate our service. To caring for the helpless and providing relief for all those who look to us for help. We consecrate our strength. To evangelizing the community and extending the kingdom of God worldwide. We consecrate our wealth, our efforts, and our lives. At this time, I would like to ask Tanya and Madeline to come and join Michael up here, as well as Stip White, who represents the search team, and uh, Johnny, as he will come, and uh, Johnny Brandon, as he will come and represent the deacons. As we want to have this time as a, a time of consecration, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, what a great and wonderful creator you are. For in your wisdom, you knew exactly what we needed. And dear Father, you watch over us. You care for us. We thank you that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And, and we worship you and we glorify your name. And dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have brought us together on this a special day. A special day because it's Resurrection Sunday. A day of celebration for us as we're grateful to you for the overcoming of sin of Jesus and that he provides that for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we come together also for the installation of this pastor. And we thank you for the words that we have heard from him. And we thank you for the words that we have heard from the congregation. A time of commitment of each. Of commitment to you and to your church and the building up of your kingdom. Dear Father, we pray for this new pastor. Father, we pray that you would give him wisdom. That you would provide for him the direction and the vision that you would have this congregation to go. And Father, we pray for, for this congregation and their surrender and their commitment to you to be the church that you desire. Because Father, you haven't called us to do church. You've called us to be the church. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time together and for the words that we've shared that have proceeded out of our mouth but from our hearts. In our commitment to, your, to you and to your work, and to the ongoing of your kingdom. And Father, to you, we want to give all praise and glory and honor. For truly you are a great God and King. 
one in which we delight to serve. And we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's a sad day that we can't all gather around and hug and shake hands. And, uh, but one thing we can do is give all the praise, honor, and glory to our Lord for making this day possible. God is good, and God has been here for us. God has made all of this possible. And I want to thank the, the, the uh, congregation for their continuing stewardship and generosity during this time when we are locked out of our church and we can't uh, participate together. You've, you've stepped up and continued giving, and I want to thank you for that because it's important. Continue giving, either electronically or on the ma by mail. Send it into the church because the church continues to need your support. Let's all now bow for a word in prayer. Father God, as I just said, we're so thankful, so very, very thankful for all that you've done for us. And we do commit ourselves to you. We commit ourselves and consecrate our time to you. We commit ourselves and consecrate our talents, giving those to you. We consecrate our service and support to you and all that we do here in this church. We consecrate our strength to you all these ways we're trying to give back because we can never get ahead because of all the goodness that you've given to us. Your works are mighty, your works are powerful, and your works are visible just in seeing how things have come together this week in service of your church. We consecrate today also our wealth, our efforts, and our lives. And we ask that you bless the gifts and bless the givers as we consecrate all of those things to your kingdom, Lord. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We missed our Bondi Thursday service this year, and I really look forward to that service where we remember the sacrifice that our Lord gave for us, and we, we pause and we reflect upon that and, and the, the meaning of Easter, what Resurrection Sunday really means. Three days ago, in the history of the church, it looked very, very dark. And, and the disciples and the followers of Christ were very, very, they were, they were sad. They didn't know what was going to happen. There was a lot of anxiety going on, grief, because their Lord that they followed had been taken from them. And then they saw him crucified. But, three days later, he rose. And he became hope for us. He became hope, and he's the living hope, the risen hope. And because of that, because of that hope, we can have fellowship with him. And also, we will rise one day, just as he did. So worship with me as I sing a song called, We Will Rise. Mm -hmm. Shall we mourn as this 
world mourns, or shall we rest in truth? Though outwardly we waste away, within we are renewed. The weight of glory far transcends these momentary trials, because he is risen. With him we will copy of God's Word, I do want to invite you to be making your way to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 3 through three through 9 with a focus on, uh, on verse 3. And uh, while you are turning there, I do want to say again uh, just how grateful I am, and how grateful I am, and my family and I are for the uh, just uh, this entire path that we've been on, uh, and today uh, culminating in today, and I, I cannot think of a better day for it to have happened as we come and we celebrate uh, the our risen Lord, and uh, I know today is a special day, and we put a great emphasis on Easter, and we celebrate the Lord rising from the dead on Easter, but I got a new slash. Next week, we're going to come together and do it again. And the week after that, and the week after that, every Sunday is Easter Sunday, or should be. 
And so I do thank you uh, so much again for just the way you have blessed us, the generosity and the hospitality and all the things that you have given to us. We are incredibly grateful and humbled by it. And, uh, and we look forward to this, to this new season, not just for this church, but for us as a family. I, uh, I cannot be more excited uh, about where we are and what is going on. And so, again, thank you. Look with me at God's word. First Peter chapter one. We're going to pick it up in verse three and read down through uh, verse nine. And God's word says this. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable undefiled and unfading kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 6, in this you rejoice though now for a little while if necessary you have been grieved by various trials and I think we can all say amen to that so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of of your souls. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you. We thank you for your word this morning, God. We thank you for the promises that are found in your word. God, we thank you for the correction and the encouragement, God, that your word gives to us. And so, God, I do ask today, as we come, as we celebrate our risen Lord, our living hope, Father, I ask you to bless God bless those who are watching this by video. God bless their families. Those who are in this auditorium, God bless them. Father, bring encouragement where encouragement is needed. Father, bring correction and conviction, Lord, where that is needed. And in all things, God, I pray, as John the Baptist, that I would decrease and that you might increase in this place. Father, hide me behind the cross that all we see is Christ and we make much of him for he is the reason why we're here. We love you and we thank you for loving us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, I don't think I have to tell anyone that uh, we're living in some strange and unprecedented times. The fact that uh, you're watching this by video and not in uh, this building on Easter Sunday is a testament to how strange the times are. And uh, you know, our world, as has already been mentioned, is gripped in fear, anxiety, and concern over this virus that has come upon us, over the effects that this virus is having, not only uh, on people physically, but also economically and in other ways socially where we cannot come together uh, so people are, are gripped with fear and concern over the effects of this virus and this fear and this concern is not unique to us in this culture and in this country it is clear across uh, the globe and so we really live in some unprecedented times and if you watch the news like I do probably too much of it you will find the nightly news reports of the devastating effects that this virus is having on people. Night after night, you see the numbers of the infected going up. And sadly, night after night, you see the numbers of people who have succumbed to this virus going up as well. And they try to tell us that maybe we've reached a plateau or maybe we haven't. They really don't know, but what we do know is that this virus is going to be around for the foreseeable future. And so you may be asking yourself this morning, well, Michael, that's great. We all know that. But what in the world does that have to do with Easter? 
Well, I would submit to you it has everything to do with Easter. Everything. As I've watched the television and as I've been following uh, these events on uh, social media, I am struck by the reality that so many are so fearful and so many are sadly, they seem to be so incredibly hopeless as this virus is running its course. This, this virus has caused great damage, no doubt. But it's also caused a lot of swearing, I think, as well, in the lives of people. I think I've said it here before. If I haven't, I'll say it now. When we come to times of trial and hardship in our life, if there is a hole in your faith, it will be exposed. When we come to hardships and trials in our life, if you have a small God theology, I promise you it will be exposed. It will show times of hardship, times of trial, times of uncertainty have a way of putting on display what we actually believe. And it puts on display very well what we actually hope in and where our hope actually lies. You see, this is true for us. In, uh, in this church and in this culture, but it was also true for those to whom Peter had penned this letter to. Uh, it was just as true for them. And so today I really want to speak to you about hope as we come to this uh, Resurrection Sunday. I think hope uh, is a good topic, uh, especially in the context of everything that is going on in our world. And so I want to speak to you about hope, but not just any hope. Our living hope. I'll give you a little context uh, to this letter for Peter to help you uh, understand what's going on. The Apostle Peter here is writing this letter to a group of believers, to some believers that are going through some very difficult times. Now, the trials they are experiencing are certainly different than the ones we are experiencing. They are coming up against trials and heartaches and suffering primarily due because of their faith. Ours is a little different, but trials nonetheless. And they are... They are suffering in some very difficult times and Peter wants to show these believers how to live out their salvation even in the midst of difficult circumstances. In spite of the difficult circumstances, how to be faithful and how to live out their life in the midst of them. This epistle, I believe, hits many of us right where we live today. So here's a newsflash for you in case you didn't know. Life is hard. Life is difficult. It is dangerous to live in this world. We just know that to be a fact from experience and what we see going on in this world. This is a violent world we live in in so many ways. And it is hard. And I am not sure there could be a better time in our lives to be reminded of this truth. That life is tough. Suffering and trials are part of living in this world. And that shouldn't surprise us. Why? Because Jesus himself told us that this would happen. He says we were going to suffer trials and heartache. We know Jesus told us that and we experienced that in our life. And so the fact that suffering and trials are part of this life should not surprise us because Jesus promised us that it would happen. And he never promised us that we would live a life free of heartache, a free of trial, a free of suffering. What Jesus did promise us, though, is that he would be with us in the midst of all those trials and heartache and suffering. And he would be with us in the midst of the storm. And Peter here is going to give us a lesson, I believe, as believers on how to deal with our Christian life in light of our present suffering. How to live this life of suffering in light of our future blessing. Peter is going to give us a message of hope to a people who are in desperate need of hope. And I would say, certainly we who gather together today are people in just as much need of hope as those to whom Peter penned this message. And if there were ever anyone who understood the importance of having hope I can promise you it was the Apostle Peter. He was a man who needed hope. He was a man who understood the importance of having hope. If you think back to the events surrounding the arrest 
and crucifixion of Jesus and then Peter's response to all of it, you can see how hopelessness can begin to manifest itself in the life of a person. Between the denial of Jesus by Peter and the death of Jesus on the cross, Peter found himself in a state of utter hopelessness and fear. He didn't know what he was going to do. He denied his Lord. And then he saw his Lord crucified. And he entered into a state of utter hopelessness and fear. So the question really we have to ask is where was Peter to go to find hope again? Where are the readers to whom he penned this letter? Where are they to go to find hope in the midst of their trouble? And where are we to go? In those moments of our lives when despair and hopelessness seem to grip us, where are we to go to find hope? Well, I believe this is what Peter is speaking about in this text of Scripture before us. I simply want you to notice a few things, and I say a few, you can laugh, and you'll learn that from me. When I say briefly in a few, just pretend like I didn't say it because it doesn't mean anything. But I simply want you to notice a few things from the text concerning hope uh, this Easter Sunday. As we look around this world and we see what is happening, you know, where is hope to be found? I would suggest to you that Peter is telling us that the first place we look for hope is none other than in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Look back at verse 3. He said, Blessed be the God and Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Here it is, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, it is the resurrection of our Lord. That's where hope begins, and that's where hope ends. It is in this reality, the reality that Jesus is alive, that our hope is grounded, and that our hope it's not misplaced. You see, friend, it is the resurrection of Jesus that all the promises of God find their yes and amen. Right? Peter had come to know this. Peter knew this. And I'm going to tell you who else knows it. Our great enemy knows this as well. He knows that that's where it all begins. Listen, our great enemy knows this and he does all he can to try to hide this truth or distort it. In any way that he can. It is not by accident that those who try to discredit the church, those who try to discredit the Bible, and those who try to discredit Christianity as a whole, it is not by accident that they will attack primarily two places. The infallibility, the inspiration, the inerrancy, and the sufficiency of the Word of God and the authority of the Word of God. They'll attack that, but then they'll also come to attacking the reality of and the validity of the bodily resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he said, here's why they do it. If they can cast doubt on that, then the whole thing comes down. If Jesus Christ has not been risen from the dead, folks, the whole house of cards comes tumbling down. The devil understands this. The enemies of the cross understand this. The Apostle Paul understood this very well when he said as much in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 17 through 19 he said this and if Christ has not been raised your faith is futile and you are still in your sins and those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished if in Christ we have hope in this life only we are of all people most to be pitied if Jesus Christ has not, been, has not raised from the dead, we of all people are to be most pitied. You see, if Jesus Christ has not raised from the dead, then you are wasting your time watching this video this morning. You might as well just turn it off, go get your bass boat, and give me a call, and let's go fishing. Because we're wasting our time if Christ has not been raised, and I promise you I'm wasting my time up here talking to you this morning. If Christ was not resurrected, 
then you have absolutely no reason to hope in the events of this world and what is going on in this world should cause you great concern. Why? Because this is all you have to look forward to. He said, you know, it amazed me when I saw people, when all this first started happening, and all these people were started hoarding all this food and all this stuff. And they're running to grocery stores and they're running to these places and they're hoarding all this stuff. And you got to ask yourself, why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because this is as good as it gets for a lot of them. This is all they have. And they want to get as much of it as they can. But Jesus Christ has not been resurrected. And we have no hope. And what is happening in this world today should cause us great concern. And we, of all people, should be most pitied. However, we do thank God that verse 19 and 1 Corinthians 15 is not the end of the story. We do thank God that verse 20 comes after verse 19. We do thank God that there is a but in verse 20. I heard a preacher say one time, I thank God for all the buts in the Bible. Because verse 20 has a but in it. Listen to what it says. It says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as, a, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. You see, friend, here is our hope. And not just any hope, but our living hope. You see, the resurrection carried Jesus not only out of the grave, dear friend, but the resurrection carried him to his throne. You see, the great day of renewal of all things has already begun. He is alive and he is on his throne and he ever lives to make intercession for us. Dear friends, our hope has to begin with the resurrection of our Lord. And I want to ask you something else. Now, how do we increase that hope? Right? How do we feed it? Right? How do we go from a hope so life to a hope filled life? How do we go from being shaken by the events of this life to a steadfast hope in the promises of God? Well, it takes more than just head knowledge of the resurrection. It takes more than just head knowledge of a few facts. How do we feed our hope? And how do we feed our faith? Well, I would submit to you, we do it by prayer. We do it by the study of God's Word. And we also do it, as Peter is highlighting here, we do it by praise and worship. You see, hope is where God is. And God inhabits the praises of His people. And that is exactly where Peter is taking us to praise and worship our King. Look back at verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice a few things here. Peter says, Blessed be the God. Some translations may say, uh, uh, Praise be the God. All right, what Peter is doing here, he's offering up praise. He's offering up praise to God. Blessed be the God. That is That echoes... Uh, a frequent Old Testament word of praise to God. And what Peter is doing here, Peter blesses God and he rejoices in what God has done. And he uses a form of praise to God that was very important. Uh, it was a very important part of Old Testament worship. You may recall from reading your Old Testament, you read phrases like, blessed be the God of Israel. Blessed be the God of Abraham. Blessed be the God of Isaac. And so on and so on, right? You know, what those phrases are. These were terms of praise and worship uh, to God. But Peter does something a little different here. Peter does something incredibly different here. Peter may be using an old form of Jewish uh, praise. He may be using an old Jewish form, but he makes this distinctly Christian by identifying God as the God and Father of who? Our Lord. Jesus Christ. What is he saying? He's saying God is no longer defined in relation to the, to the heroes of the faith in the past. God is no longer uh, defined in relation to his deliverance of Israel. 
But now, now God is defined in relation to the living and resurrected Jesus Christ. You see what he is saying here. In other words, God is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living, right? He's the God of those who are living. The Old Testament heroes praise God for his promises of a future salvation. But Peter is telling us to praise God. Why? Because in Christ, all those promises have come true. All those promises are, are true. Right? And I'm just going to tell you, if that doesn't fire you up, man, your wood's wet. I'm just, it's just the way it is. That should get you excited this morning. And now we know that there's more to come. Absolutely. There is more to come. For Christ is to come again. No doubt. But our living hope is real. And it's real in our living and resurrected Lord. And we praise God for that truth. You see, all other religious heroes, all other religious founders are still dead and in the grave. Muhammad is dead. Buddha died and he is still dead. Confucius died and he is still dead. Joseph Smith in the Mormon cult, he is dead. Mary Baker Eddy, she is dead. William Taz Russell, he is dead. But praise God, our Lord lives. And we praise God for that truth. Our Lord came out of the grave. And so Peter encourages his readers here to praise. Why? Because it's helpful. It's a helpful remedy uh, for hearts that are weighed down with discouragement because of suffering and because of trials. Praising God for what He has done, praising God for what He will do is also how we battle the drift. And if we're not careful, we will drift uh, towards hopelessness in this fallen world. You know, it's very easy for us to drift in that direction because all of it's in our face all the time. We experience it. And if we take our eyes off of what we have in Christ and who we are in Christ, I promise you the drift to hopelessness and despair will happen. So Peter tells us to praise God. And then he gives us a couple of reasons why we should praise God. Notice he addresses the great mercy of God. You see that there? He said, blessed be the God and Father, in verse 3, of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to what? His great Mercy. So he addresses the great mercy of God. Not just mercy, but great mercy. That word great there carries with it the understanding of an infinite, an infinite mercy. Right? It, it doesn't end. There's no bottom to the mercy of God. It is a bottomless well that we continue to pull from. It is infinite. His great mercy was one of the motives behind of God's uh, granting believers eternal life. Sharing uh, in this life with Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 expresses this divine generosity very well. Listen to what it says. It says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, listen, He made us alive. Together with Christ. You see, by grace, you have been saved. And so Peter chooses here to highlight the great mercy of God. Why mercy? Well, mercy focuses on the sinner's absolute miserable and pitiful condition that we find ourselves in. Outside of Christ, we are dead in trespasses and sins. And we are helpless and hopeless to do anything about it. And mercy points to the miserable condition that sinners find themselves in. It is a reminder to us that if we are in Christ, we have not received what we are due. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. And mercy is withholding from us what we do deserve. So we have been, uh, the punishment that we were due has been withheld from us. And Peter says, praise God. Listen to this. For his mercy, because that mercy did what? Has caused us to be born again. Has caused us 
to be born, born again. We praise God for His mercy, but we also praise God for His salvation. Notice the very strong God-centered language here that Peter uses. He says He has caused us. It's just like what Paul said in Ephesians. He has made us alive. Peter says, well, God has caused us to be born again. That phrase right there, He has caused us, that phrase should shut the mouth of every person who believes they can earn salvation by good works or by something they can do. You see, sinful men are helpless and hopeless outside of the grace and mercy of God. Scripture says that God is the cause of all who are born from above by the Spirit of God. You see, we need to praise God that one day, if you're in Christ, you need to praise God that one day He looked upon your helpless and hopeless state and He chose to extend to you great mercy and great grace. And He opened your eyes to your sin and He changed your heart and He gave you faith to believe and He extended to you the gift of repentance that you might be saved. And I love how 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 25 and 26 puts it, but I'm going to paraphrase it and I'm going to make it a little personal for you. Listen at this. It says, That God granted you repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and you came to your senses and escaped from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. You need to thank God and He opened your eyes to the reality of your sin and your need for a Savior. God did that. Listen to me, friends. Christ's resurrection spells hope for us, not just because Jesus lives, but because by God's great mercy, those of us who are in Christ, we live as well. The very phrase there when it says He caused us to be born again, the very phrase born again, that is a, that's a resurrection term, right? Being born is to be alive. You, know, you were born alive physically into this world, but spiritually dead. Now you have been born again to a new life spiritually. You have been resurrected, as it were, to a new life individually, but it gets better. You see, the reality of being born again individually carries with it this understanding that one day, this crazy world in which we live is going to be made new as well. The whole entire cosmos is going to be made new one day. This current world with all of its problems, all of its viruses, all of the hang-ups that this world has, one day is going to be made completely new, just like you have been if you're in Christ. And just like you will be one day when we're glorified, if you know Christ. And so we praise God because Jesus is alive. We praise God because of his great mercy. And we praise God because of his great salvation. And so I want to end here real quick. There it goes real quick. I want to end here by showing you where this hope that we have uh, should point us. Where should this hope direct us? Where should... This hope focus our attention. First, we are pointed to not just hope, but like I've said, we are pointed to a living hope. We are pointed to a living hope. You see, friends, our hope is not a dead and empty hope. It is not a dead hope and a false hope like many in this world have. Why? Because our hope is not in a principle. Our hope is not in a concept. Our hope is not in some, uh, you know, political party or some political ideology. No, dear friends, our hope is in a person. And that person is alive. And because of that, our hope is also alive. Second thing this hope points us to is our future inheritance. Look again at verses 4 and 5. Pick it up at the end of verse 3. It says that we are uh, born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And pick it up in verse 4. He says to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. And listen to this. Kept in heaven for you. This inheritance that you have, this inheritance that we are promised, 
It's not corruptible. It's not, uh, it can't perish. It is undefiled. And it is being kept for us. And it gets better. Being kept for you. Who by God's power are being guarded. That, and we're being kept for it. It's just this beautiful picture that he is painting through faith. For a salvation. Listen, that is ready to be revealed in the last time. All that this inheritance is culminates in this ultimate salvation. And notice what he says there in that verse 5. He says, and it is ready. It is ready. What is Peter saying here? He is saying that our inheritance, while it will be revealed in the last day, but God has it ready for us now. It is finished. Nothing needs to be added to God's preparation. And hear me, unlike all the, you know, the utopian dreams and, and the fantasies that so many people in this world have about what this world uh, should be and that will actually never happen. Unlike that, God's plan for the future is already a reality. It's already a reality. And Peter is reminding us very vividly here that we are moving away from what we cannot keep, which is the things of this world. And we are moving towards what we cannot lose. And that is the inheritance that God is keeping for us one day. And then finally, this hope that we have because of the resurrection of Jesus directs us to our ultimate salvation. Look at verses 8 and 9. It says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining, here it is, the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And here he's talking about really our final salvation. And, and that language may sound strange to you, but let me, let me just explain it to you this way as quickly as I can. There's this reality that we live in currently. That theologians have coined, we live in between the already and the not yet, right? We live between the already and the not yet. In other words, we live in this tension between what is already a reality in Christ and yet what has not happened yet, what we have not experienced yet. We have all the promises of God that are fulfilled for us, but yet we've not experienced them all. But yet they're as real as if they've already happened. And so there's this tension that we live in that is caught between the already and the not yet. Think about salvation in this way. There are three ways you can think about uh, salvation. You see, you are saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. Let me put some theological words on it. You are saved, which means you are justified. You are, you are uh, declared innocent. Of your sin. In the moment when you receive Christ, when you transfer your trust from all other things and place your faith totally and completely in Christ, in that moment, you are justified. It's a, it's a legal term. It's, it, you, are, you are declared innocent of your sin. And so you are saved. You are being saved. That means we are sanctified or being sanctified, right? That's where. All of us are in our uh, life right now. We are being sanctified. And sanctification simply means that we are being made to be more like Christ every day. Or at least you should be. We should be growing in our faith. We should be growing in our understanding of the Word. We should be growing in our understanding of Christ. We are being sanctified to be more like Jesus. And so we are being saved. And then you will be saved. You are going to ultimately be glorified one day when we're in heaven. Now, nobody's there yet. I know there's some people who think they are, but nobody's glorified yet. Okay? That is our final salvation. So we're justified, sanctified, and glorified. And such is the faith and hope of those of us who know and believe in Christ. You see, the salvation of our souls in the last day really is the goal of our faith. It is to be with Jesus, glorified with Christ in heaven. That is the ultimate goal, isn't it? It's not to have things on this earth. It is ultimately to be with Christ. And we wait 
We wait for the salvation that Christ will bring at his second coming. And yet, at the same time, we're already experiencing salvation today for those of us in Christ. Again, it's somewhat of a, of a paradox, but it is the hope that we have that the New Testament gives us. And because Jesus has already come in the flesh, the kingdom of God has already come. And so our hope in that sense is realized. Why? Because we know Christ. Or more importantly, Christ knows us. <laughs> However, because Jesus is coming again, the kingdom of God is yet to come in all of its fullness. And so in that respect, our faith is always looking ahead. It's always pointed to the future. You see, Scripture teaches that there is this sense in which Christians live in a future that is already present, kept for us by our risen Lord. And friend, that is a glorious, glorious thought. And I will tell you this, that is the promise and the hope of Easter. We have a hope in our risen Lord. And that is why we can travel through this life with all of its trials, with all of its viruses, with all of its headaches, and we can never lose our hope. Why? Because it is grounded in the reality of our risen and victorious Savior. Amen? All right, you bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to pray. I want to make an appeal this morning. Someone who may be watching who's never transferred their trust from all other things and placed their trust totally and completely in Jesus. The greatest hope that you have is the reality that God will forgive. If you will humble yourself and you'll repent of your sins and you will cry out to God for forgiveness not making any excuses for what you've done, just humbly asking God to forgive you and to extend that great mercy to you this morning. If that is you this morning, I would encourage you right now where you are just to get on your knees before God and cry out to God in faith and in repentance. And we have the hope and the belief that God will forgive Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If that's you this morning, I would encourage you to do that. And while there's not a way for you to physically come forward so we can talk to you, I would encourage you to reach out to us uh, sometime this week. Myself or Pastor Rich would be happy to talk with you, and to, to get with you, and to talk with you about your decision. For those of you who are here or watching, who may get a little uptight and a little anxious about the things going on in this world, I would encourage you, dear friend, just to get on your knees, to pray, and to worship God. Feed your hope, the hope that you know you have in Christ. And Father, we do thank you. We thank you for your love, God, for us. We thank you for the grace that you extend to us. God, I pray for that one or, or, or two who may be out there listening, Father, who have never received Christ. Father, I pray that today is the day of their salvation, Lord, and that you would do whatever you have to do, Lord, to remove the scales from their eyes, to give them faith to believe, Father, and to draw them eternally to your side. And Father, for those who are in Christ, God, I pray you would encourage them today. God, that they would be reminded afresh and anew that our hope is in a resurrected Lord, not in some dead deity somewhere, but because He lives as we've sung this morning, we can face this day and we can face all days ahead of us. Lord, we love You and we thank You for loving us and for loving us first. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless y'all and y'all have a good evening. Thank you.